Thanks, Brenton. Um, hi, everyone. I guess, uh, yeah, welcome to the overview webinar where we'll be introducing you all to the UKB Research Analysis Platform, otherwise known as the RAP. My name is Alexandra Lee. I'm a senior community engagement and biomedical data scientist working at DNA Nexus. And I am joined here by my colleague, Ted. Hey, everyone. Um, I'm a principal scientist and bioinformatics trainer at DNA Nexus. So to get started for today, I just wanted to briefly review the learning objectives that we have for this webinar. So uh, we plan to articulate the benefits of analyzing UKB data on the RAP. We will explain the structure of the RAP to you, including defining what are projects, as well as what are the different data types that you can work with on the RAP. We will list the different types of analysis strategies that you can use on RAP. Uh, we will articulate the relationship between data set and cohort. We will help you to develop best practices for performing your research on the RAP. And finally, we will introduce you to the UKB uh, community that Brenton already mentioned. Uh, this is a really valuable resource for helping you to get started along your journey to using the RAP. So uh, to get started, what is the UKB Research Analysis Platform? So the UKB Research Analysis Platform, otherwise known as the RAP, is a cloud-based computing platform that allows for fast and secure analysis of UKB data. And so this platform contains both a suite of analysis tools as well as this very rich UKB data. So the suite of analysis tools uh, for the platform is actually very extensive, but I just wanted to highlight a few of them here that we'll talk about later in this webinar. So the first is this cohort browser, which is a tool that allows you to uh, explore and visualize phenotypic data as well as generate cohorts. Uh, the second is this table exporter app, which is a tool that lets you export phenotypic data. And then there are also these interactive workstations like RStudio Workbench and Jupyter Lab Notebooks. So what is the benefit of using the RAP? So first and foremost is the access to this very valuable UKB data. So this UKB data contains health and genomic information for half a million participants. So it's this really, um, really rich and valuable resource to be able to leverage. Um, and so it is over 20 petabytes in size. Uh, and so uh, because of its size, this makes it kind of infeasible for you to just download the data and work with it on your local laptop. Instead, you'll need to leverage some other sort of cloud computing system or some high performance computing cluster. And so for those of you who who were familiar with working with UKB data on these high performance computing clusters, you'll remember that it is a little bit of a hassle to get your software environment set up on those. And uh, even to dispense data can take up to a couple of weeks. And so this is where the wrap comes in. Uh, there's some pre-compiled software environments that are ready for you to use to get started with your science. Um, and it also takes just a couple hours to up to a day to dispense data. So this is really nice. Uh, the second is that this platform is both secure and compliant, and this is really important given that we are uh, working with hundreds of thousands of private human health records. And then finally, you're able to integrate across um, a variety of different data modalities. So uh, from this image here, you can see that for these 500,000 participants, we have phenotypic data, genomic, imaging, and other omic data types. And so this platform facilitates being able to integrate across these different data modalities to perform uh, more complex and systems level analyses. And so just a sneak peek at some of the data that's available to you on the wrap, there is whole exome data, whole genome data, and we just uh, received new, uh, two new imputed data sets uh, from Genomics England and TopMed. Uh, and then for um, new data releases, you can, uh, for information on new data releases, you can follow the link here. So how can you get started using the UKB wrap? So the first thing that you'll do is you'll fill out a, a UKB application as some of you already have. Uh, once you are approved by UKB, you can register to create an account on RAP and create a project. You can dispense data to this. Uh, and then there are a couple of different types of data that you can work with on the RAP. Uh, and depending on the different data type, there are slightly different workflows um, for them. So the first type of data are these phenotypic data sets, and these include metadata associated with your participants. So uh, things like patient diagnosis, for instance. And so with this phenotypic data sets, you can explore that data and also create cohorts. And we'll talk a little bit more about this later. The second type of data are these bulk data. 
Um, and these include things like genomic and imaging data files. So you can think about things like uh, VCF files, for instance. And so these bulk data files can be pre-processed using uh, software apps from the tool library. And then finally, we can combine these two types of data to perform downstream analysis. So for example, we can perform a GWAS using image-derived phenotypes. We can perform some sort of statistical modeling or some other type of omics integration. And so today we're gonna walk through uh, this workflow with you. So starting at the top, the first step will be to fill out a UKB application. Once you fill out a UKB application and you become a new user, you will receive 40 pounds worth of credit that you can use towards your analysis. Um, and just one thing to note that Brenton already mentioned is that we have this really nice research credits program uh, where uh, early career researchers or those from lower middle income countries can apply to receive funds through this. Uh, so this is a really nice program that's generously funded by AWS. Uh, and so for more information about this, um, we invite you to uh, click on the link here um, to get more information about this program. And just a few more notes about billing. Uh, so the other thing you can do is you can estimate costs uh, for your different analysis that you want to run using the rate card that's linked here. Uh, and you can also create an organizational wallet so that multiple different members can have access to the same set of funds. Okay, so now you have uh, your UKB account. Uh, let's get started using uh, the wrap. So uh, we now have registered to create an account on wrap. The first thing we'll do is create a project and dispense data to this. So what is this project? So this project is a collaborative workspace that allows multiple users to have access and use the same set of data. So you can kind of think of about this like your current working directory, um, sort of um, analogously when you're thinking about programming, uh, that's what this is. So uh, it's the smallest unit of sharing. So uh, you can share this project with other uh, members who are on the same UKB application, but you can't share um, subfolders or files from within there. This project contains uh, different objects, including data files, software apps, and also workflows. Um, and it also contains a job management system that allows you to check the progress of different jobs or analyses that are running. Um, and you can also save results to your analysis to this project to be shared with uh, the other members who have access to this project. Okay, so one best tip that we have for when it comes to creating your project is that one user uh, that one user associated with a given UKB application uh, should create this project and dispense data to it and then share that project with the data with the other members um, that they want on that project. And so in this way, you can save some time since it does take a couple hours to up to a day to dispense data, just depending on the size of the data that you're dispensing as well as what the queue length is. Um, and so then you can uh, save the results of your analysis to this project um, and it can be shared with the other members that are on this project. Uh, so one note about troubleshooting when it comes to dispensing data that you might run into um, is if you are missing data after you dispense it, uh, we encourage you to log on to your account management system. And when you're in there, you can navigate down to check the different data buckets that there are. And essentially what you'll look to see is if the data that you're interested in is in your data bucket. If it's not, then you'll need to apply for that data of interest. But if it is, uh, indeed in your bucket, but you don't actually see it dispensed onto your project, then you'll need to contact UKB support using the email that's over here. And so when data is first released, it's first released to the UKB showcase, which is a screenshot here. And so this UKB showcase is a resource that contains both UKB data as well as documentation on how that data is organized. And so uh, there's about a three week lag from when the data is first released onto this UKB showcase. And then when it shows up on the wrap, and for more information about uh, different data release versions, you can visit the link here. And so to make sure that you're using the most up-to-date version of the data, there is a way to check this by navigating to the settings tab when you're logged on to your uh, UKB wrap. And you can click on this check for updates button, and this will tell you if there are any updates available. And if there is, you can refresh your data. Okay, so we mentioned that there can be multiple members that share a project. These different members can have different levels of access. So the first is this viewer access where the users can view and download data. Uh, the next is uploader access where uh, building upon the level of access for viewers, they can, in addition to that, run analyses. And then contributor access, which again, builds on 
uh, uploader access, but in addition to being able to run analyses, they can also manage data so they can edit and delete files. Um, and finally, um, admin access, which is the most powerful access where uh, in addition to managing data and running analyses, they can also manage uh, the membership uh, that different members have. And so here are uh, the different file operations that can be performed on the files contained within your wrap project, uh, where, of course, these file operations will depend on your level of access. Uh, the other thing to note here is that depending on the type of file, you'll have more limited file operations. So for example, for individual genomic data files, uh, you won't be able to download these for security reasons. And so in general, we encourage all users to make sure they check their MTA to ensure that they're uh, being both secure and compliant with their agreement with UKB. And so uh, we mentioned that there are uh, two different types of data that you can work with on RAP. So the first are these phenotypic data sets, uh, where these phenotypic data sets contain metadata associated with your participants. So these include things like patient diagnosis or age or sex. And this, um, these phenotypic data sets can be accessed via the cohort browser that we'll talk about later in this webinar. The second type of data are these bulk data, uh, which contain quantitative data measurements associated with participants. And so these include things like genomic and imaging data files, where these bulk data files uh, are usually processed using software apps from the tool library, as well as your own custom tools, um, as well as workflows. So in addition to the data that's available to you on, the pro on your project, you can also add data to this. And there's a couple different ways you can do this. So the first way is to upload data from your local machine. Uh, the second is you can copy data uh, from a different project, but just a note here that that project has to also be associated with the same UKB application, and we'll explain uh, why this is in a little bit. Uh, next, you can also add data from a server using a URL, uh, and you can also uh, import data from an AWS S3 bucket. Okay, so what have we learned so far about getting started with the wrap? So we've introduced to you to what a project is, which is this working directory. That's also the smallest unit of sharing. You can dispense data to this project, um, and you can um, refresh the data when there are updates available. Uh, there can be multiple members that share a project, and these members can have different roles and therefore levels of access. And there are two different types of data that you can work with on the wrap, including these phenotypic data sets, as well as these quantitative bulk data. And finally, files can be uh, uploaded, organized, annotated, and searched for on the wrap. OK, so um, we mentioned that there are two different types of data that you can work with on the wrap. And so in the next couple of sections, we're going to spend a little bit of time just giving a bit more detail as to uh, what those uh, two data types are. So um, let, first, we'll talk about these bulk quantitative data files. So remember, these are like your imaging and uh, genomic data files. So when you're logged on to RAP from uh, the, when you're within the root directory of your RAP project, uh, you'll see this bulk data folder, where this bulk data folder contains um, subfolders that contain um, quantitative uh, results associated with your different participants. So these include things like imaging data, so like brain MRI data, um, as well as genomic data, like uh, whole exome data. And then we can even drill down further into these uh, subfolders. And so if we drill down into, say, this uh, brain MRI folder, we'll find a set of files where each file corresponds to one participant. And each participant file is named using a seven-digit unique identifier, also known as an EID. Uh, and just a note here that the full identifier is actually blocked out for security reasons, uh, but this EID is a product of the pseudonymization process where um, this seven-digit unique identifier is shuffled between different UKB applications. And so remember, we mentioned that when you're uh, adding data, uh, if you're trying to add data from a different project, that project has to still uh, belong to the same UKB application. And this is because if you try to add data from a project from a different UKB application, the EIDs won't actually map. Uh, and so these individual participant level data files can be grouped based off of the first two digits of their EID, where you can see that each of these participant data files start with this one zero here. And so they're grouped into this one zero folder that's within our brain MRI folder, that's within our bulk data folder. 
And so these bulk data uh, files uh, can be searched for using their uh, EID that we mentioned. Um, and just to note here that this EID is a mock EID, so that's why it's shown here. Um, but they can also be searched for using this field ID, which is an identifier that maps to the UKB showcase. And this uh, field ID corresponds to um, a result or measurement that's associated with a participant. So for example, here, this field 134 here corresponds to uh, self the self-reported number of cancers that were uh, taken upon assessment. And so what have we learned about these bulk data files? So uh, these bulk data files contain quantitative data measurements like our whole exome data or MRI image data. Um, and these uh, files are categorized within the UKB showcase as either a bulk or a records type. So here are two screenshots showing uh, bulk data. So uh, genome, uh, sorry, uh, genotype calls and then a whole exome uh, data where the item type for these two are either records or bulk. Uh, and so they can be searched for in the UKB showcase using um, these two keywords here. Uh, so these bulk data files can be at the per participant level, as we showed, but they can also be aggregated across participants. So you can think about things like PVCF files, for instance. Um, and these per participant files are also grouped by the first two digits of their EID, as we showed you. Okay, so that's a little bit about the first type of data. So moving on to the second type of data. So um, now we're talking about our phenotypic data sets that, remember, are these um, metadata associated with our participants, so things like patient diagnosis. So to first explain um, these uh, phenotypic data sets, we first kind of need to talk about the structure of these phenotypic data sets. Um, and so just to note here that this might seem a little bit abstract and a little bit technical, but it's important that you understand the structure of these phenotypic data sets because uh, understanding this is what will allow you to um, extract the phenotypes that you're interested in. So for a given uh, data set, they are composed of these entity tables where these entity tables have fields as columns. And so just to give an example here, so um, we can think about our repository of UKB data as our data set. And this data set contains um, entity tables, including a participant entity table where we have uh, participants along the rows and fields along the columns here, where these different fields have a human readable uh, title, such as sex and year of birth, but then there is also a numeric field name um, that course that maps to the UKB showcase. And so uh, just a little bit more information about these field names. So these field names have a standard notation that look like the following. So we have a P field ID, underscore I instance ID, underscore A array ID. Uh, and just to uh, add a at a concrete example here. So for this field 4080, which corresponds to blood pressure measurements that were taken at this assessment center, we have uh, four instances that correspond to uh, four different visits taken to this assessment center, where this instance ID will range in values from zero to three. And then we also have um, two arrays. So these are two measurements that were taken, where the values from this array ID will range from zero to one. So just a couple of examples. So the field's name that corresponds to the first blood pressure measurement taken during the initial assessment visit will look like this. So P4080 underscore I0 for the first visit, underscore A0 for the first measurement. Uh, and then the field name that corresponds to the second measurement taken during the fourth visit looks like the following. So P4080 underscore I3 for the fourth visit, underscore A1 for the second measurement. And so uh, going back to uh, kind of our semantic graph that we had earlier, so these data sets are composed of phenotypic data associated with our 500,000 participants, where we can filter um, this data set based off of the different fields um, to generate a subset of patients or cohorts uh, using our cohort browser that we'll talk about in a bit. So what have we learned so far about uh, these phenotypic data sets. So these phenotypic data sets are organized by entity, where these entity tables have fields as columns. And these field names that we showed you have a standard notation. And these um, phenotypic data sets can be explored via the cohort browser and also used to build cohorts. OK, so speaking of our cohort browser, um, so 
Um, going back to our workflow here, so we're at the point where we have uh, created an account, we've made a project and dispensed data to it. Uh, we told you about the two different types of data that you can work with, um, but now we'll just kind of walk through um, how you can work with these phenotypic data sets um, using the cohort browser. So what is this cohort browser? So this cohort browser allows you to work with these phenotypic data sets and visualize and explore the data, as well as generate cohorts that can then be shared with your collaborators. And so the way that you'll open up the cohort browser is you'll navigate to the root directory of your RAP project, and you'll click on your phenotypic data set here. And this will open up your cohort browser, where um, there's a couple different components to your cohort browser. So the first thing that you can do is you can explore your phenotypic data by creating uh, tiles on this dashboard here. The second thing that you can do is you can create cohorts by filtering um, based off of uh, different fields. And then finally, you can uh, compare two cohorts together uh, by performing uh, some sort of by performing some sort of downstream analysis like GWAS, for instance. Okay, so to start, let's first explore our data a little bit. So the way we'll do this is we will click on this add tile here, and this will open up a field explorer window where we can then search for uh, some field of interest. And so say we're specifically interested in white blood cell counts. Uh, so that's what we'll type in to the search window here. And just to note that uh, when you're searching, you're searching by that human readable field title. Uh, which is white blood cell leukocyte count here, um, as opposed to the field, uh, the field name that we were talking about earlier. So using the field title, we'll start typing in white, and we will select white blood cell count, and then we will add it as a histogram, uh, as a tile. And so now we have this, our first tile on our dashboard, which contains a distribution of white blood cell counts for our 500,000 participants. Uh, and just to note that this yellow exclamation mark here denotes that there are some participants that have uh, that are missing this information. Uh, we can change the type of display that we have. So instead of a histogram, we can uh, select a box plot instead. And so now we have a box plot display for our distribution. The other thing we can do is we can layer on additional information. So we can add uh, an additional type of um, an additional field here. So we can add sex as a secondary field. And so we can uh, select grouped box plot here and add this as a tile. And so now we have a second tile with a distribution of white blood cell counts, but now grouped by sex. So feel female and male here. And so um, now we've explored our data a little bit, our phenotypic data a little bit. The next thing we can do is we can uh, go on to create cohorts. So to do that, we will click on the Add Filter button here. This will again open up kind of a field explorer window where now we are looking to create a cohort or generate a subset of patients based off of some field of interest. And in this case, we're interested in generating cohorts based off of whether or not participants have smoked before. So we'll type in Ever Smoked here and select Ever Smoked. And then in this case, we're interested in creating a subset of patients where they have ever smoked before. So the value is yes here for this, um, and we'll click apply filter. And so now we have uh, our first cohort. So this is our uh, case cohort of participants who have ever smoked before, and there are about 300,000 participants. We can save this, and now we can share this as uh, a cohort with our other collaborators if we're interested in. And then um, the next thing we can do is create the complementary or control cohort. So we can essentially take all of those remaining participants who were not in these ever smoked cases. And so now we have uh, two cohorts, our case, uh, our case cohort with about 300,000 participants and our control cohort with about 200,000 participants. And just to note that these uh, two cohorts are color coded here with our cases in blue and our controls in purple where we can see that this coloring also extends down to our tiles on our dashboard, where we have our case and control uh, cohorts or our um, data now in these tiles are grouped by our two cohorts. And so now that we have these two cohorts, one of the things that um, you can do is perform something like a downstream GWAS analysis using these two cohorts. 
Uh, so if you have a more complex phenotype that you want to use to generate a cohort, one of the things you can do is you can combine cohorts. So for example, we can take our existing case cohort and combine it with another uh, cohort that contains um, patients with high, high platelet counts. And we can take the intersection of this and combine it. Um, and so when we, uh, this generates our combined cohort where now we have 1500 participants where this cohort now contains those participants with both a, um, who have ever smoked before and have a high platelet count. So now that we have our cohort, there's a couple of other things we can do in this cohort browser. So the first thing we can do is we can navigate to this data previews tab. And when we do that, we have a tabular form of our cohort data with participants along the rows and our different fields of interest along the columns here. We can also, um, oh, so you can export this phenotypic data using the table exporter app uh, that Ted will talk about later. And the next thing you can do is you can also navigate to the genomics tab where you have information about the distribution of allele frequencies. Uh, so you can search by uh, gene or coordinate here. Uh, you have this interactive lollipop plot uh, to look at allele frequencies. And you also have this uh, transcript annotation information. And then if you scroll down farther on this uh, genomics tab, you can also get um, allele frequencies for your cohort in reference to your population. Uh, and just a note that this um, genomics tab is only available if you have access to the latest release of the whole exome data, which is where these annotations come from. Okay, so one final thing that you can do um, in this cohort browser is that we showed you how you can create cohorts based off of phenotypic data or features, but you can also uh, generate cohorts based off of genomic features um, where you can filter by gene symbol, variant effect, variant type, and variant ID. So essentially, you can think about creating cohorts, um, like say a cohort of participants who have a BRCA1 mutation that results in some uh, specific variant effect. So what have we learned about uh, this cohort browser? So this is a tool that allows you to explore your phenotypic data set, where you can visualize, create, and compare cohorts. You can also create cohorts based off of genomic features in addition to phenotypic traits uh, where you can filter uh, by position type and effect. These cohort um, tables uh, display the first 30,000 rows. So for more, you'll need to use the table exporter app. Uh, and finally, you can visualize up to 15 tiles and select up to 30 columns using the cohort browser. Uh, and just a note that this cohort browser is using um, the reason for kind of the uh, limited numbers here is because the cohort browser is using a thrift server, which is a shared server that's allowing all users to access this, which is really nice. So um, I'm going to be talking about, uh, so Alex talked about, you know, basically filtering data and exploring data with cohort browser. So like we're going to kind of move on with the idea that you've created a cohort and that you want to get the phenotypic data out of um, uh, into some sort of uh, delimited file like a CSV file. Okay, so Alex uh, just covered the, uh, the section that says explore data here. So now we're going to um, uh, talk about kind of more of the kind of downstream analysis components. So uh, there are two ways of extracting the phenotype data for further analysis. So the first is uh, Alex mentioned was table exporter app. And so um, there's going to be kind of links to instructions to use Table Exporter. It's a little more user friendly. Um, so what you need to do is you need to supply it with a cohort or a data set or um, what's called a dashboard view as an input. And then you need to supply it with a list of fields. Um, so once you do that, um, you run it um, and it basically kind of executes in the background. And then when you, you'll um, basically receive a delimited text file to your project. Um, the one I'm going to be focusing on today is really the X extract data set. So we haven't talked too much about the command line toolkit. Um, uh, there was a question in, in the Q&A about that. Um, there are, I put as an answer to that, like there are some links to like uh, introductory videos on the command line. So this um, actually uses kind of built in um, uh, functionality to uh, do the same thing, but it's a little more powerful in terms of how you can kind of extract the data. 
so like I said, this, these are the links to Table Exporter. Um, so just uh, there's a nice tutorial here. And definitely um, any questions, please don't hesitate to ask on community.dnanexus.com. OK, so um, I'm going to be showing you, since the majority of you are our users, I'm going to be showing you really kind of how to utilize DX Extract dataset with R. So the first thing we have here, so this is, uh, we're going to, uh, this is kind of our basic command line template, um, but we are, are going to be able to execute this from R uh, using some built-in R tricks. So you can see that in the curly brackets, we have data set ID and field list. So these are things that we're going to provide uh, via R, and then we're going to be able to execute them. So we'll use a, a package called glue to basically substitute these values in here. Um, and then once we have that, uh, once we have that uh, command, we can execute it um, on our machine and do the DX extract data set with the system command. So your data set ID, so if you go into your project and you select your data set and you um, with the checkbox and you click the uh, information um, button, which is the I button in the top right, you'll get information about your data set ID. So it's going to be, you want to have it in the format of your project ID and then colon and then your rec the record ID for the data set ID. Uh, this can also be a cohort ID as well. So like I said, uh, that's going to get substituted right here. Um, and then, um, uh, so, but uh, like I said, we need to talk a little bit about kind of getting the field list information. So there is um, an option to DX extract data set that uh, has this dash DDD, and that's short for dump data dictionary. So this is uh, this will basically uh, dump three CSV files into your your own system, and basically uh, it'll give you information. So your data dictionary has information about all of the different fields. Uh, so we'll be leveraging both this title. So we'll be searching on title uh, to extract this name, this name, which is you can think of as the name of the column in the data set. There's also the coding dictionary. Um, so this basically is kind of your secret decoder ring for the um, categorical data. Uh, the raw version of it is uh, stores the categories as integers. And then you will see that um, uh, that basically it gives you a mapping from the code to the actual human readable um, category. So let's talk a, a little bit about that data dictionary. So again, all of this, we will make this uh, the slides available. And I will uh, make try to make sure that we have a notebook available with all of this code as well. Um, but what we need to do is we first need uh, we need to basically glue together the name and the title to get uh, and the entity name. So and uh, this is just a little bit of code that does that. So this is what we're actually going to input in our field list here. So once we kind of have that, um, so we took our data dictionary file and we did a little modifications to it. And then we can, um, uh, so this is just one way you can kind of search. Um, I also, uh, in the notebook, I do have a kind of a searchable table uh, way of kind of uh, finding out what these, uh, what these field names are, but you can see we're uh, filtering on coffee type, um, gender, uh, whether they smoked, agent recruitment. So when we do that, you can see that uh, we actually get this list of field titles. And then we have that list of uh, part uh, basically entity and then uh, field, field names that we can, we'll basically kind of slice out this column and pass it into um, into DX extract data. So you can see here, uh, basically we, we do that. So this is our list of fields. So we've got that, um, we've got our data set ID. So the, those are the two things we need to input into DX extract data set. And so this will work. Um, so once we uh, use glue, glue template, um, we can then uh, basically execute the command and what we will get are the raw values. So again, uh, the categorical values are encoded as integers in this, and we need to basically decode these. 
Uh, so there is an example notebook um, linked here. Um, I do. Uh, I did write a little R package uh, to kind of help out with this. So basically, this will take in, um, you know, those da those data dictionary files, and it will use it to decode your data frame. Um, so you can see we've got ones and zeros for this particular field here, and they're encoded as uh, yes and no now. So this is just kind of an example of um, basically doing the categorical decoding. So just for the section, so we talked about um, the Table Exporter app a little bit, and we pointed to you to the tutorial. And then we also talked about the DX extract data set command. So um, like I said, there was a question about command line. Um, we'll mostly talk about kind of running executables via the UI. But like I said, there is that link in the Q&A um, for, the, for the command line videos. So uh, just to be sure, be clear. So like you know, Alex talked about the difference between like the phenotypic data. So that's what we just worked with, and um, now we're going to be working with the bulk data. So these are going to be things like your PVCF files. So we want to basically use these built-in executables on the platform uh, and process process these files. So apps, basically, like I mentioned, there are ex executables that run on the platform. Um, one of the key things is that when you're working and processing lots of files on the platform is to work with the metadata. Um, sorry, this is a little small, but um, you, you'll see that all of the files, you can actually do a search and you can retrieve all of the files with a particular field ID. So that's very helpful that you can pass that list of files in. Um, in, into like your um, executable statement and you can do batch processing with that. Um, again, you can also search on EID as well. Um, so let's talk about uh, just kind of the general notion of bulk files. So like I said, using meta metadata to work with the multiple files is very important. I'm going to be talking about a, an app called Swiss Army Knife. So this is um, basically one of the most useful apps on the platform. Um, uh, don't worry if you can't read this. Um, there's another slide that kind of takes you through all of the tools that are available. Uh, you also have the ability to bring your own software. Um, so you can build your own applets. We have a couple of webinars about that. That will be linked in kind of one of the later slide sections. Uh, so, you know, if there's interest uh, in kind of covering that again, uh, we can. Uh, but don't hesitate to ask questions on community.dnanexus.com. Uh, we want you to be successful with what you want to do on the platform. So here's a slide that shows some of the tools that are available in Swiss Army Knife. Um, like I mentioned, a lot of those uh, tools that we kind of know and love as bioinformaticians, such as SAM tools and VCF tools, are available. Um, but also, uh, you know, GWAS tools such as Regini and Plink, um, as well as other other tools that we all know, such as Picard and working with BGen files. Um, so much more information is at this link here. So here's an example of kind of opening the UI. And so when we run via the UI, there's basically two inputs that we're going to need to run. So the first is like we need to supply it an input file name, and then um, we need to provide a command that we want to run on it. So here you can see in the UI um, we can select actually multiple files uh, with Swiss Army Knife. So we have clicked into this folder here, and we we can select multiple files in this and pass them into uh, pass them into Swiss Army Knife. So we're going to be running VCF tools in our in our example here. So we're going to be doing a frequency analysis. So um, by passing in this command, um, so you can see it's just VCF tools, and then we want to run on all of the uh, star.vcf.gz files that we pass in. We can actually execute on all of the all of the files. Uh, there is an alternate way um, to do this, um, and uh, which is called, uh, um, sorry, DXFuse. So you can actually list the files directly within within um, your command line command if you use a, a put a slash mmt slash project. So this will basically uh, read from your project 
your uh, project uh, storage. And so, like, for example, this might start out with bulk and then exome data and then, you know, some VCF file within there. So just quick notes about um, apps and applets. So they're executables that you can run on apps. And so they're really kind of made to kind of process files. So you put a file in and then you put a file, uh, you get a file out. Um, so there's multiple ways to run applets. We didn't show you the command line, but again, we have um, videos on that that we can refer you to. Um, also the web UI um, is what we focused on. So we talked about specifying file inputs. Um, so this, uh, I will say that, you know, when you're getting started, uh, stick to path and file name. And then when you get a little more sophisticated, you can start working with the DXFuse file system. Um, I think definitely one of the things about the platform is that, you know, there's lots of complexity, but we tried to kind of make things easy on you by kind of showing you gentle ways to kind of get started. Okay, so um, we talked about, so Alex talked about kind of working with UKB data on wrap. Um, so we talked about cohort browser, we talked about kind of built in apps. Um, there's also the ability to run workflows, but there's and um, all of those special kind of uh, workbenches or work workstations that you can use. Um, we didn't talk too much about web terminal, but the nice thing about, uh, so this is TTYD. This already has the DX toolkit installed, so you can do a lot of your command line operations via this one, uh, TTYD as well. Um, let's see, so um, yeah, I I guess we, we should have put this uh, a little earlier, but um, so just want to kind of end with the idea of that this is kind of a paradigm shift you have to make in your head. So working with local analysis. Um, so doing analysis. Uh, so a lot of the times you're used to everything being on your own computer and including the software. So the switch that you have to make with cloud-based analysis is that um, you're actually using a machine temporarily and you have to kind of request it. So um, once this is, uh, once you have, have this kind of temporary instance, um, usually with apps or our workbenches, like the proper uh, software is going to be installed to them. And then you will need to kind of bring the notebooks, uh, like your notebooks and your data. Like, so if you have a data and CSV file, these will need to be transferred over from project storage into your temporary computer. Then you can execute pro and produce results on the instance. Um, so once you've done that, um, anything that you generate, because this is temporary, needs to be transferred back into the wrap project. So there are also, um, at the end of this, there's also links to um, basically our webinars on JupyterLab and RStudio. So hopefully that will be, uh, that will help get you started with that. So, uh, you know, overall, we just talked about lots of different ways to work with UKB data on the UKB wrap platform. Um, I think the one thing we didn't mention is that Stata is also available. You might have seen that in a slide. Um, there's much more information in the documentation about that. Um, so we talked about kind of doing local analysis versus cloud analysis. And the main trick with cloud analysis is that anything you kind of generate on the temporary uh, a computer is going to need to be kind of uploaded back into the worker. So let's talk about where next. So um, if you're very new to cloud computing, we have a couple of courses, uh, webinars for you. Um, so if you're just very new to cloud computing, there is this cloud computing for scientists webinar recording. So this will teach you, uh, introduce you in much further depth, um, some of what I showed you in those, uh, those slides about cloud computing. Um, if you come from a high, high performance computing on-premise system, we have a webinar for you as well. So this is going to basically let you um, uh, basically translate your HPC skills to cloud. I promise you it's um, less intimidating than you think it is. So this is that table I was mentioning. So these, these are links to kind of not only the documentation here, but there's also these links to all of the webinars. So for example, with our Studio Workbench, we have both the training webinar and we have a partner webinar that we did with our Studio. Um, so there is a lot more kind of information in these 
um, in these links. I uh, just want to end with talking about the UKB rap community. Um, so I've mentioned it before, but this is actually a really great resource. Um, so not only just for like searching on questions that you might have, but for asking things, uh, the community is really great. We try to be as responsive as possible. Um, there's also the GitHub repository with all of our example net notebooks and webinars. I uh, just want to end with some of the upcoming events. Um, so there, uh, Anastasia is going to be talking about end-to-end -end target discovery with GWAS and FIWAS. Um, there's going to be a virtual meetup and a keynote presentation by Brian Browning. And then uh, stay tuned for work with working with proteomics with the O-Link data, uh, variant discovery and annotation. And again, these are links to subscribing for information and all webinar recordings. Uh, Brenton, would you like to close with talking about the community a little more? Yes, absolutely. Um, so you can find links uh, to the community and uh, related material that Ted was mentioning in the related content uh, module that looks like a paperclip icon in the bottom of your screen. Um, and uh, the community is free to join. It takes less than two minutes to be able to get uh, to get registered. And then um, you can collaborate with other researchers on there. Uh, we've got a ton of tools and tips. Uh, if you're just getting started, there's a getting started section for there. Um, and if you're looking for um, more sample pipelines, sample notebooks, uh, you can head into the tools and tutorials section on there. And then um, if you're looking for more upcoming webinars and things, you can head into the announcements tab.